My people, my people, what's going on? This is your boy Monroe, AKA He Smiles. Uh, I, I just had to hold there because you know what? I am so grateful each and every time we go live. I am so grateful be, to, to be the proud host, the proud host of the Naked Truth Experience. And yes, we are back, y'all. This is episode 32. It is nine o'clock on the East Coast. It is six o'clock on the West Coast and y'all can figure everything out in between. But I am so happy that you are back with us today. Now, if this is your first time, we welcome you. Thank you for stopping by the Naked Truth Experience. And I guarantee you, this won't be your last time. If this is your 32nd time or any other time that you've come back to watch this show, to participate in the comments, I love you, I love you. I'm grateful for you and thank you, thank you, thank you. Please keep sharing the message and keep spreading the message. I just had to take a moment that I love to hear from our viewers throughout the week in between shows, letting me know your comments and all the different things that you've either learned or some things that made you think or even things that maybe you disagreed with. That's what The Naked Truth is about. It's about sharing our perspective respectfully, right? Um, but I appreciate that engagement and that interaction, which leads me to say, as you're coming in, as you're coming in, tell people in the chat where you're viewing from. Wave, let them know, hey, how you doing? Let them know if you're sipping on a little something, what you're sipping on. I'll let you know what I'm sipping on tonight in just a moment. Um, but then also, it is very, very important that you help us spread the message by liking, sharing, and subscribing, right? Go on those Instagram pages, go on our Facebook page, our YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, y'all, because that's where you can find all of the past episodes. And again, it's broadcasting live there now and on Facebook Live. Um, and then on Instagram, I wanna say this, every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern, I'm doing a talk back from the episode of the previous night. Last week, we had our doctor who came on, Dr. Cedric Rutland. He came and joined us for the talk back. You never know who may be coming to the talk back tomorrow morning. So you can talk a little bit with me and we can talk about what we learned on tonight's episode of what we experienced. Okay, so we're doing the like, share, and the subscribing, but also just one more thing about for us to connect, get into that Facebook group, the Naked Truth Experience Facebook group. All right, all right. Now, listen, tonight, if you can feel my energy, um, I'm excited. I'm going to tell you why, because this subject that we're talking about tonight, sex work is work, is something that I have been um, very intrigued by on so many different levels. And y'all know I spill my tea. Y'all know I tell my naked truth. So I'm going to let you know um, what my orientation is to this whole topic and why I'm so excited to have the guests that we have on tonight and we'll meet them in just a few minutes but before we do i want to welcome y'all know who he is he's our resident wine guy the little wine guy dan what's going on man how are you sir what's going on monroe it's always good being here man listen, listen brother um last week the energy was bananas we had a great time and i'm already feeling that energy pouring back in um and it's always good to see you man how are things good with you thing. Too. Things are going good over here. I'm excited about this episode today, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I feel that, Dan. Dan, what are we uh, What are we sipping on tonight? What are we sipping on? Because I've, I've already taken several sips, so. You know, just like your show, we travel through lots of topics. I think it's reminiscent to follow it through the world of wine. We're traveling to a new place today. And uh, we're actually going to be going into Argentina, to Mendoza. Yeah. Uh, they make really, really great Malbecs, but today we're going to explore Syrah yeah. strictly okay. from the uh, Lorca. These guys here okay. make a really yeah. nice little wine. And, you know, here in Napa, we deal with $100 bottles, but there's no reason that you can't get a great bottle of wine for $10. Listen, and you know, because my, my pocketbook ain't supporting that $100, so I got That's to right. 
shit. <laughs> That's right. You know, so we got to have daily drinkers and celebration drinkers. And this is a fantastic daily drinking wine, you know. And this is the one thing that I wanted to touch on is a little yeah. food for thought. Okay. You'll notice on this, it says without oak. A lot of wine sits in wooden barrels, you, you know, the traditional yes. oak cask. Yeah. That can do a lot of amazing things. But you'll find a lot of wines have been saying, you know what, we're going to put it in stainless steel so you can taste just the berry, no other inter influences. And it's a great way to explore wine and taste just the grape itself. Ah, so does the, okay, because I've been to wineries where I've seen the oak barrels there. So mm -hmm. the oak, does it change the constitution of the wine versus the metal? Okay, all right. Yeah, you know, you know how uh, you taste vanilla? Yeah. And you know, you go to the grocery store and you get vanilla, like the extract, but not the real yeah. stuff, the, the, the imitation? Real. Yeah. It comes yeah. from wood. It's called vanilla in. And so we the, the pores of the wood, when you will let wine sit in it for a very long time, yeah. the ebb and swell, it, yeah. it seeps out that vanilla flavor into the wine over a period of time. Uh, see, listen, this is why I have this man here, because I don't know what <laughs> the hell I'm talking about. I just like to sip from time to time. But so, you know what I, you like, baby. That's I all that matters, like. man. And That's I all love, that matters. Listen, I love a Malbec, and I'm so happy that we're doing the Syrah. Is that, mm. Did I say it right? The Tonight is a Syrah. That's right. Okay. All right. Dan, as always, man, I appreciate you. Great to see you. Shout out to you in Napa. I'm actually on your Good coast job. right now. So, um, well, maybe yeah. we'd be able to meet up next week. I would like to, I would like to, right? And we got a special, uh, Friendsgiving Thanksgiving episode coming up, so can't wait to share what we're going to be sipping on. Uh, Absolutely, next week. I, look right, man. I look forward to chatting with you guys all next week. Cheers, that's what's up. Take care, all right, all right. As always, I appreciate Dan and his expertise and letting us know. So, who knew that the oak had. The vanilla flavoring, right? You know, I'm, sound, I'm trying to sound all sophisticated. You know, I'm gonna tell somebody that, and I'm gonna act like I knew it all the time, but I did. But anyway, uh, <laughs> let's get to this tonight again. We were talking about sex workers work and really having a discussion around the decriminalization and the destigmatization of this industry. And we have two phenomenal guests on tonight, and we're gonna do a quick pop up, and I'm gonna let you know who they are, and then we'll dive into our conversations. First, we have Jet setting jasmine now tonight we were supposed to also have her partner king noir but he was unable to make it but y'all see this beautiful woman here she is representing for the both of them so jet setting jasmine how are you tonight go ahead and unmute because i want to i want to hear your hello <laughs> hello hello i'm doing amazing and i just learned so much already see? See, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I'm like, I've been sipping and now I can sip with my pinky. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna sip with my pinky. Up. Right there with you. <laughs> Jasmine, I'm gonna come to you first. So I'll be right back with you. All right, look forward Sounds to talking good. to you. All right. And then we have another wonderful young woman who is on with us tonight. Y'all, I want you to welcome Jay St. James. Jay St. James, where are you? How are you? Hey. hey, all right, listen, Jay is killing y'all with this hair. She's letting you know what's good. I <laughs> love it. I love Thank it. You. Jay, how you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Yes, yes. Well, listen, I'm so excited, as we talked about in the pre-show, to have you on the show. And I'm going to talk to you second, and we're going to have a wonderful conversation. So hang in there, and we're going to come back. All right? y'all and let's dive into this first conversation so i want to go ahead and bring jasmine back in hey jasmine, jasmine so okay you are this like mogul right oh thank you <laughs> no thank you you're the one that's doing all this stuff because when i read your you know your bio profile thank you mm -hmm. shout out to my girl Crystal Tantric Yogi, y'all, she's been, she's no stranger to the show. She was one of my first guests, had me crying up in here, weeping and sobbing, telling me I was all right, just as who I was created to be. So I have so much love for Crystal mm. and she connected me to you and King Noir. So I was so excited to, to go on your page and really kind of find out, but you guys own a, um, film company, you're a mm -hmm. producer, mm -hmm. um, you are a performer yourself um, in the films. Um, I believe King Noir is a master fetish. We trainer. both are, mm -hmm. master okay. fetish trainers. Master mm -hmm. fetish trainers. Mm -hmm. But then you got another title over here because mm -hmm. you're also a psychotherapist, right? I am. Mm -hmm. so, so I love it, I love it, I love it. And it really kind of, first of all, kind of dispels the first myth, you know, as I was really kind of mm. going to here, the mm -hmm. stigma with this industry in, in, in the first place is yeah. 
who are these people that is doing this work, right? Mm -hmm. Who are these mm -hmm. people that are doing this work? And we'll get into some definitions in a moment, but I just want you to talk about sure. the stigma that exists and the assumptions that people make about individuals in the sex work industry and how that has impacted you over time and how you've overcome yeah. it. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think it's really interesting when we think about um, who these people are that are doing the work. Um, there isn't this island of porn stars. Like we are your family members. We are your therapists. We are your nurses. We are your educators. We are your parents. We are in, when you go to Thanksgiving, should you choose to do have a Thanksgiving or Friendsgiving? Be safe. Someone, be safe, whatever you choose. But someone that is going to be gathering with you is in the sex industry in some way, shape or form. And I think it's really important for us to just normalize that because this idea of like, it's them over there doing things that we enjoy watching, but don't enjoy supporting or talking about um, is what keeps stig stigma alive and well. Yeah. So yeah, there is a lot of stigma. A lot of the, the ideas that are that we enter this work out of desperation, mm. um, which automatically suggests whether desperation or not, that a person doesn't have autonomy and decision-making capabilities for their body and the line of work that they would like to use to either get out of desperation or stay out of desperate situations. Yeah. Um, that Jasmine, certainly... Mm -hmm. Jasmine, let me... I, I want to I wanna just break in real quick, because you're saying yeah. two things that I want to pull out really quick. Yeah, First of all, um, here's my naked truth. I mm -hmm. was introduced to porn when I was eight years old mm -hmm. at a very young age, right? Mm -hmm. I had an older cousin, God rest his soul, yeah. who had some Playboy magazines. Mm -hmm. And I was like, ah, oh my God, right? Like I was, you know, mesmerized mm -hmm. by the nakedness. I was mesmerized mm -hmm. by the anatomy. Um, and then shortly after that, I was introduced to actual adult movies. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And quietly kept, I had a little uh, enterprise going on where I was selling adult movies on the schoolyard. But hey, we ain't gonna talk about that tonight. <laughs> Who's the mobile now? <laughs> right, I, was, I was a little enterprising young You were man. a distributor. Right. I was a distributor. <laughs> didn't even know it. But what I have to say is I've been in some instances, and this isn't the show, we'll talk about that, but I've some instances I've felt like I've been addicted to porn. Um, and I've talked about that before, but we've also talked about how porn has many um, uses in marriages and in relationships and so on and so forth and entertainment. So, and we'll get into that. But you said something that stuck out to me. Many people and a lot of the people who are judging the performers are the consumers. And so it is this double standard of, oh my gosh, I can get this enjoyment and I can, I can just, I can love it or do it, use it however I want to use it for pleasure, for education, for we can go on and on. Um, but I'm going to judge the people who are on the screen, but I may idolize the people who are on the screen. I may actually want to be the people or envy the people who are on the screen, but I'm going to still judge me to judge you. Talk to us about that and like ha how you've had to encounter that and, and, and combat that. Absolutely. So, you know, fortunately for me, I came into the industry already established as a psychotherapist and a gerontologist. I, I, you know, come into come into the space um, out of full free will and desire to do so. Um, and also coming into this industry with those same judgments, those elitist sorts of attitudes, um, the hierarchy that I call it. It's like, you know, as if no one knows, then it's like up here, right? But then like you start going down that hierarchy, the more you decide to share your sexual expressions with the world. And that is just because we have, we're in a culture that is dominated with these really incredibly negative and oppressive and repressive thoughts about sexual exploration. Mm -hmm. Intimacy in the form of, like you said, like being fascinated with the, the anatomy of the body. You weren't even sexualizing at that at that moment, at that age. By the way, eight is now the average age that kids are uh, consuming porn. I didn't know that. Yeah. And I mean, it, and, it, and it makes sense because we think about how how easy, you know, devices and how easy it is yeah. for, for kids yeah. to access now. And it's really unfortunate. But um, to back to your question we get into this um, really cognitive dissonance, right? Like it makes me feel good, but then I feel shame about doing it. Mm. And is that shame really your shame? Or is it the 
culture that we subscribe to? Is it the value set of the people around us? Is it the hypocrisy of the person who's telling us like that's bad and that's dirty, but it's a billion dollar industry. Ah. And sex has been selling forever and it sells everything. Yeah. So this idea of like porn, um, people kind of having this guilty pleasure and shaming the people who provide that pleasure, you know, it's 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 not new. Um, we've been, yeah. you know, it's the same thing with, you know, we see this in any type of oppressive relationship. Yeah. It's where it's your fault for making me do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah, in terms of yeah. overcoming it, having these kind of conversations always yeah. helped me, you know, because it's like, I'm not the stereotypic porn person. So I, st the, excuse me, the stereotypic stereotype of a person in porn. So yeah. whenever we have a voice as sex workers to be able to show actually whatever you thought is wrong, we are pushing back against that stigma. We're normalizing and we're giving people a chance to kind of reckon with that cognitive dissonance. Oh, wait, this person is actually nice. Yeah. This person actually does enjoy doing what they're doing. And we're challenging some of those age old beliefs. Can I ask you something though? And we yeah. got a comment in a moment that we're gonna bring up. Cause you bring this up. Do you ever feel like, because as a black man, here's mm -hmm. the mistake that I would make sometimes. I live right outside New York city. So I'll be on a New York city subway. Or when I lived here in California, I'd be on the bus. And mm -hmm. if a black person started acting ignorant as hell, right? I would try to overcompensate because yeah. I was in that way trying to like be more proper because I mm -hmm. felt like I needed to counteract the narrative that was being seen. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't just be me. So even when you said pushing back, um, mm -hmm. having these conversations, do you feel this burden that you have to represent people in the sex work industry in a light? Like, see, look, I'm just like you. See, look, I may have a degree mm -hmm. or see, look, like, do you feel that burden to like, let me show you all that we're just like you or can you just, I'm me. Mm -hmm. Like, if I don't have a degree, whatever, like as long yeah. as I'm choosing to do this or, you know, whatever the case may mm -hmm. be that respectability. That's where I'm trying yeah, to Yeah, those respectability politics. So I don't feel a burden to do that. Um, I do feel I do feel a responsibility to my colleagues. Um, I feel a responsibility to my purpose in life, which is bringing healing. Um, and it is helping people navigate really problematic, uh, problematic feelings and, and thought processes. So I do use my platform in porn. I do use my respectability politics to get into spaces, to make space and room for my colleagues and my people. I do also create work that represents the full range of sex and sexuality amongst black and brown folks. So my work is to broaden representation of the sex industry. So that way, when unfortunately, little, you know, young people are accessing porn without context, they are not having these horrific representations of themselves. And maybe there's a ounce or iota of how real sex does, uh, you know, real sex occurs and it can occur in a consensual and respectful way. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I feel like my purpose is to bring a certain level of representation and to use those respectability politics and use my position in other industries to open up open up the platform and the, the mindset. But I do agree with you. It is it is it is taxing nonetheless. Right, right, right. But now let me say you talk about the work that you all do. Now I, I did my research. Okay and now. And let's say I told you like I mean I'm still an avid consumer of porn, right? Mm -hmm. Um and I've and I've had to uh you know contend with my own um challenges with that and, and to be right. able to use it in a constructive way and also for entertainment purposes. Mm -hmm. I want to say you all do amazing work. So let's Thank just be you. anybody <laughs> Anybody who anybody who would uh, consume the material, the work that you all produce, let me tell you, they're going to say the same thing. Now, I have, mm -hmm. when I advertised that you all were coming on, mm -hmm. I had a wonderful comment from a viewer that I actually want to read. So let's go oh, ahead. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I literally never used to watch it, speaking about porn. My girl put me on. I love the way it tends to center on women. Not to mention, you're not getting shit like BBC dominates black slut. I'm also into kink, so it checks a lot of boxes. And a natural black female dom is hella empowering. Representation matters. And then she said something else. Okay, what's what okay. did she say next? Where are you at? I, <laughs> I love that they show up as their authentic selves, both individually 
and as a couple. You get to see them as multifaceted, intelligent humans, not just porn star. And this viewer is a late 30s queer cis gender woman and she is speaking about the work that you produce wow i need those slides <laughs> i want to hang that over my over my computer <laughs> so I, wow. I i just I, what is what's what's your reaction when you get that type of response to what you're putting out and then again mm -hmm. talking about that you know overcoming any of those you know because i want to i want to know when you hear things like mm -hmm. slut or whore or if people say those things or judge you like you're human right so i'm sure those things have the yeah. ability or opportunity to penetrate mm -hmm. your heart or your spirit or mm -hmm. you know whatever at times um yeah. but but mm -hmm. how do you respond to this type of feedback what does that say to you well i get chills all over um and not to be you know not to be uh arrogant or anything but i honestly like this is the naked truth right i go in my mind we nailed that shit like that's exactly what we set out to do yeah. i don't know what that 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 person watched exactly but whatever they watched they captured the so that that makes me feel so so good it makes it worth it it makes the sacrifice of hearing some of those like ridiculous comments this is if 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 no one else but the people who get that feeling are watching our content, then I'm good. I made the right decision because this person can see themselves in our work. And that's why I got into the porn industry is because I could not find representation of black kinky people that were not, not being forced to perpetuate negative stereotypes about black and brown people and weren't able to show the multifaceted self of themselves. So I mean, that person could not have made a better um, testimony. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. sharing that with me. No, that's awesome. Listen, when she sent that to me, and again, I, I'm going to put a plug out there to all my viewers. Please, please, please hit me up. Let me know how you're responding to the content um, because you may end up on the show in some form or fashion. Jasmine, I want to get to my conversation with Jay St. James, but we're going to come back all together because you brought up a lot of things. We're going to talk about um, racial inequities. We're going to talk about that mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. industry. And I want to do some more definition of terms because um, we're not only here to share, but we're also here to to inform and, and to educate individuals. So I want to make sure that people are walking away mm -hmm. with some real factual information about the sex worker industry. Thank you so much. I can't wait to bring you back on in just a few minutes. All right. Yo, um, that was awesome. I love bringing the smile to people's faces. And, and thank you to that viewer who shared her um, feedback. I'm so excited to get to talk to this young woman here, Jay St. James. Where are you? How are you? Hey, doing good. <laughs> How are you feeling? What did you, did anything resonate for you in that conversation that we, we just had? Like um, anything pop out for you before we dive into who you are and your story? Yeah, it was really great uh, to hear from Jasmine, to hear that, you know, she was established and a worker that uh, went into it already with a career established. And um, especially hearing that she doesn't feel burdened down, but she feels a responsibility to speak up for the other colleagues. Um, I, I'm the other colleagues. Like, I want to hear that from those that have the platform and, you know, pornography on film and in print is usually going to be people's first introduction before they meet full service sex workers and doms in person like me. Yeah, yeah. Listen, um, <clears throat> Jay, you are a part of the Black Sex Workers Collective. Um, and that's actually how I was connected to you. Um, I was, I, as I was preparing for the show, I'm reaching out to, you know, folks like, hey, I, I need to talk to somebody who can talk about legislation or decriminalization and give me their perspective. And you responded to me and I so appreciate you being here. Can you talk to me a little bit about why is it first of all first of all you mentioned what you do so let us know like what what is your what is your occupation within the sex work industry what's your occupation within the sex work industry so i'm considered a in-person worker so i don't have a lot of images of me if it's not like on my social media it's not out there so i'm an in-person worker i'm a pro dom and full service worker full service means that with some clients there can be like an exchange of actual sex so yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. And how long, when, when you sent me the, the, you sent me the email, you said career sex worker. Why did you put career? And what does that mean for you when you say career sex worker? Well, I personally started at 16. Um, I was probably a kid like you. I started with other people my age. I wasn't trafficked in. I wasn't pushed in, nothing like that. Yeah. Um, I had immediate financial needs for you know, extra stuff after school. And it was an easy way to make money because the boys were always interested in me. Um, I say career worker because even though I've gone to nursing school, you know, like the guest before mentioned, I'm the nurse. I went yeah. to nursing school. You know, I've uh, gone to business school, but I'm very highly sexualized. I'm a very highly sexualized person. And an easy way for me to navigate that has always been falling back into sex work. So at this point, I've done it since I was 16, pretty you, steadily. And yeah, it's my yeah, life. Yeah. So you, you brought up something. When I was doing the research, I ran across um, R.J. Thompson, who's the director of the Sex Workers Project. And I, I he talked about talking about sex work and, and people's reasons for being in it on a spectrum. I'm looking at my notes here. And the spectrum was talking about choice, circumstance to coercion, right? Choice, circumstance to coercion. Jasmine mentioned choice. But the thing that I loved about it you talk about choice as well, but you also talk about circumstance um, because there are circumstances for all of us and the reason why we go to work, period. We need money to exactly. take care of bills, to live, right? Um, exactly. but, right, right. So so I, I liked how he brought that out. Like there's choice and there's circumstance and those two things can coexist. But then we talk about coercion because one thing that I started to see with the conversations around decriminalizing sex work is that people keep getting sex work and sex trafficking. They're saying those are, those are the same things, right? They're saying those are the same things. Can you speak to the distinction between, cause you said you weren't sex trafficked at 16. Correct. That wasn't your story. You made a choice to enter into the industry in whichever way you did at that point, and then that your career continued on. Can you talk a little bit about the dis distinguishing between sex trafficking and, and sex work? Yeah. Well, sex work is always consensual. There's, you know, not such a thing as, you know, for sex work, that's automatically trafficking, that's automatically rape. Sex work, like any job, has to have an era of consent to it. So uh, people do, they definitely conflate the two. We saw that happen a lot with FOSTA SESTA, which was the big nationwide legislation that went through just a few years ago, yeah. meant to stop traffickers, but stopped all advertising of and that was sexual online, services. Right? Correct. That was correct. Yeah. This was a federal bill in the United States. So it dealt with things online. It made the actual websites responsible for anything that happened on them. So and that's where we really saw nationally this cementing in of trafficking with sex work. Um, a lot of the rescue industry organizations really feed into that. You know, they, they feel that all sex workers are heavily coerced, if not forced into it. Yeah. So there's yeah. that difference. Again, that spectrum comes back where there's the coercion. You know what else I loved about in kind of doing the research is that in, in and we'll, we'll talk about too, when we all come back together a little bit more, but I want to open this door here is that first of all, the term sex work was coined back in about the 1980s because it wanted to make sure that there was the implication of labor. So that, because when, I, when I'm when i looking up decriminalization of sex work, their labor rights is a hashtag, right? And so to really look at this as an industry that is worthy of the rights and protections as any other job any other industry that somebody would enter into. And the thing in, in a lot of these arguments for the decriminalization of it, and I liked, again, I'll, I'll, I'll say R.J. Thompson and some of the things I read, he was like, look, on any job you have, there are pros and there are cons. On any job you may have, there are opportunities for exploitation. So the only difference about sex work is that there is this social and this sexual stigma that's attached to it to where people feel like sex workers don't have the same or shouldn't have the same rights and protections um, as other people, like, you know, in, in different industries. So I like that to where, again, it's talking about sex work is an industry. Sex work is work. Um, I want to talk about your journey. Did you always see 
what you were doing as form of labor, as an industry? What was that evolution for you if that didn't start out like that? I definitely always saw it as something that needed to be monetized. Um, I was a kid that was pretty focused on money from a young age, so I never saw it as um, energy that should be given away for free or that I should just entertain people because they're there and they have an expectation of it. So I definitely, um, while I never really saw, especially at 16, you know, I was a street worker. I never really saw me as a part of an industry, but I always saw it as a labor, as work, as something I put effort into and something that was heavily monetized from day one. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, so you talk about your early days and, and for many, one of the reasons they talk about decriminalizing is that again, a public health situation when we're talking about even um, stopping the transmission of diseases, stopping when we're talking about incarceration, mass incarceration, stopping the targeting. And we know who gets targeted, right? Black and brown folks, but also, and I wanna give a huge shout out to my trans women, my black trans women um, who are often always the ones who are heavily targeted and marginalized. And this is Trans Awareness Week, so I just want to give a major shout out to them. Um, but for, for, for individuals who have to go underground because there aren't protections for you, it makes you vulnerable. So some of the cases that we hear about the horrors of the sex work industry are a lot of times as a result of you all don't feel that you have any recourse or any protections. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Absolutely, it's the criminalization of your activity that makes it unsafe for you to reach out. Um, if you know people are, we, we hear a lot that they're worried about different workers spreading STDs and stuff. Workers have a much higher rate of condom use, you know, all across the board than civilians will because we don't have that false sense of trust with people that we've just met. So um, when you heavily criminalize what we do and make it to where we can't talk to our doctors about what we do, we can't tell them why we need prep. We can't tell them why we had another recent exposure. We can't tell them why we want STD tests, you know, this frequently, things like that. It's the criminalization that shuts down that communication and that makes the whole society unsafe for us. When you're literally worried that everybody is going to turn you in wow. you don't seek out the safest places or the best options that you have because you don't want to burn them yeah i want to see if we have that slide there was a slide that i found um, that actually speaks to what you're talking about sex workers in countries with legislation me measures were half as likely to contract hiv and other sexually transmitted diseases and 30 percent less prone to have sex without a condom okay what is it so that kind of basically supports what you were talking about that if it is if you are made to feel safe that you can seek you can seek health care just like anybody else without fear of being you know punished or penalized or you know fines or turned in or any of that um that there is data that shows there is less instance of you know contracting there's more there's like you're able to get what you need you're able to get what you need um, I want to talk a little bit about the legislations that, so let's say this, if you did not know folks, sex work uh, is only legal in what, like eight counties in Nevada? I think correct? it's seven, but but yeah, it's the county population has to be under 700,000. Okay, so everywhere else in the United States, there is penalties, misdemeanors, if I was looking up a lot of times, it's, it's, it's a misdemeanor. But I also saw that, and I think, don't quote me, but the federal legislation that you talked about could potentially carry up to like 10 years sentences if there's a violation of that, I believe. And I don't want to quote, but we can, you know, we can do some fact checking. But talk to us a little bit about like what's happening with mass incarceration with individuals and how they're being targeted by police and what that also, uh, with the impact on the community. Yeah, well, obviously, like you mentioned, it's usually going to be non-cisgendered people. Um, it's gonna be black and brown people. Those are gonna be the people that are assumed to be workers. Those are gonna be the people that are shut off and don't have the access to resources. We're not, um, constantly have to humanize ourselves even to our doctors. So we're not able to 
approach our doctors the same as if we, you know, were maybe a cis white worker, things like that. So, I mean, that really shuts down those paths. Um, what was the last of your question about the no, po you, police? Okay. Yeah, police brutality, right? Because we're talking about Black Lives Matters, trans lives, all trans lives matter, all Black Lives Matters, right? But we're talking about sex workers too. And there was a march back in August in New York um, in solidarity for decriminalizing and but talk about that interactions with police in the in the the prone being prone to police brutality. Yeah, yeah. Um, the police, you know, can also assume that you don't have the uh, the autonomy that was mentioned earlier. That you don't have free will. That you don't have consent. Um, police um, are known, especially in the U.S., for coercing or forcing sex acts from workers when they come in contact with this. And it's easier for them to come in contact with this if we can't mask in some way, if we happen to be trans, if we happen to be non-cis, if we happen to, you know, stand out like living in a state like Oregon and being one of the few Black people. I was in an area that had a 1% Black population in the county. You know, it's you can't fly under the radar in those situations and police see you as vulnerable. Even here in Nevada, where they have the legalization, the brothel owners, you know, frequently make quotes that you should be working with them or you're risking arrest or worse, arrest or worse. You know, we know what happens with police and workers. It's the or worse. I want to talk about your outlook career wise. Where where do you where do you go in this industry? You mentioned your and I don't want to say FS. Let's 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 clarify some terms here. FS Dom. Yeah, full service. For full service Dom. Okay, what is the outlook for that? As far how long can you be in this industry? I'm surprised I'm still in it. What? I'm like damn near forty. I'm really surprised. I keep oh, thinking that I'm going to not be marketable, and listen. it doesn't happen. So. I'm not cis, you know, um, I stick out as the mixed exotic black everywhere I go. So I I don't see that I'm gonna be pushed out anytime in the next 30, 40 years. Um, I know workers that do full service in person that are, you know, 60, 70 years old, or at least they're booking at 60 and 70 years old, they might be 10 years older. So um, you can definitely branch into production, things like that, managing, um, doing the booking and stuff for other people. Um, I have relationships with some of my clients. They help me out financially in between sessions. Um, but I started at 16. I still, you know, have rates higher than some of like the 20 year old college co-eds and stuff like that. Um, damn near 40. I've had five kids, you know, I've got scars on my stomach from a bunch of colon cancer surgeries. I'm still marketable. So I don't see there being an end to it because, you know, people are always going to pay and it's predominantly men. Men are always going to pay for attention that they can't get otherwise. You know, they understand the value of money. They have access to the resources. They're always going to gatekeep it. And I'm never going to entertain people for free. So... They, they said, um, you know, people said everybody's, well, I know not everybody's having sex, but people have sex all the time. And I've heard the term for a lot of sex workers like, I, like, I'm not about to do it for free. Why not get paid for it? And I've heard people are like, you the dumb one because you having <laughs> sex for free. I'm getting paid for doing something that I want to do, right? It's been a different perspective around there. Julius, can you bring that comment back up? I, I saw it flash and I want to, I just want to address that really quickly. So um, you mentioned starting at 17. Would you recommend sex work for teens be legalized? legalized? If so, at what age? Thank you for that. I don't yeah, I don't support the legalization of sex work in any ways. I support the decriminalization and I support not arresting people. I support allowing people to have free will. Um, we do actually see teenagers in the U.S. get arrested for engaging, you know, in sex work, for sending photos, things like that. So I don't recommend um, that they get into it, that it be legalized, which would involve the regulations and all that. Um, but I do advocate for it to be completely decriminalized, which cuts out the criminal effects for kids who might be in the industry. And then you can look at resources and you can look at why they're doing things. You can look at helping them in other ways, but it doesn't help anybody to throw them in jail, especially not someone engaged in what would most likely be some form of survival sex work or, you know, something like that at that age. I want to I want to just make a distinction because I'm a little confused. You said you are not for the legalization, but you're for the decriminalization. 
Correct. Can break that down for me just a little bit more. What? what yeah. So legalization is what you have in those in Nevada. It's what you have in those like seven or eight counties in Nevada. Yeah. So um, prostitution is legal within brothels, which means that you have to be working at a brothel. You have to be picked up by a brothel owner, which means that a lot of the trans people don't get picked up, which means that uh, a lot of non-whites don't get picked up. You know, there was one club here that has 200 workers in a month on the roster and two of them are black. So you're automatically criminalized. We can't legalize fairly in a white supremacist society because you're giving the power to certain people to gatekeep, but we can decriminalize and get an equity for everyone. Come on, mm. listen, I had to snap on that. Uh, white, so, come on, we got a, we got another comment. I, I, I can't wait to bring Jasmine back in because we're going to talk about the white supremacy and how that does. So I am loving this conversation. I'm at a point in my life and consciousness where I feel we have to destigmatize our entire socialization and deconstruct what we've been taught about how to be. Our lives have been informed by the macro structures operating under white supremacy. Racism, sexism, heterosexism, patriarchy, religion, etc. She said there was a part one. Part two, we particularly, come on, Shelly, particularly women um, have been taught that sex is only to occur in the context of heterosexual relationships and any out, anything outside of that is demonized. I would provocatively suggest that the structure of marriage is not any different than sex work. Whoa, hold on. I'm thinking of the idea that marriage is required in order for a woman to give it up. How is that any different from sex work? Now, listen, you you had a response to that. Jay, come on. I need to respond to this real quick. Okay, so <laughs> legally in a lot of states, it's not. Legally in a lot of states, like in Oregon, if you as the wife have sex with your husband and expect him to pay the bills in exchange for that, if you cannot cut sex off in the relationship and still expect to be taken care of, legally on the books in a lot of states, it's not. They selectively enforce like with all laws, but legally there's not a difference between sex work and a marriage. Okay, Come on, Shelly. <laughs> Thank you, Shelly. <laughs> Y'all heard it here on the Naked Truth. Now I had not, I hadn't even thought of that. Jasmine, what's what's your thank you for joining the conversation back again? Thank um you. listen, this is amazing. Thank you. I'm, I was I was so excited about this episode. Jasmine, just um, you know, we've entered a lot of things into here, the right mm -hmm. supremacy, and then there was this whole piece around um, you know, sex work in the context of a marriage. What what's your response to that? What's your and then Jay, so, Jay came and dropped the knowledge on me. So yes, Jay, thank you for that. Thank you for the knowledge and thank you for the work that you're doing for all of us that also engage in, in live sex work, any sex work. Um, and thank you also for your service as a nurse. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is you got like another 30 years up in this game, okay? Because right. I'm over here at 40, <laughs> like, what you mean to trying to hang up her boots? No, we're we're in this for the long haul. Okay. <laughs> um you know, I mean, I think that that person's comment is, is is so right. Like we're socialized on top of socialized on top of socialized. And when it comes to black and brown people, we have not been given the autonomy of our bodies, even attitudes and beliefs around our bodies since been, since been, since been. You know, we were a commodity. And then the minute that we choose to use our bodies and profit off of our bodies the way that we would like to, it's problematic. You know, and I do completely agree with the difference between decrim and criminal and criminalization. Um, and excuse me, legalization. Yes, because we're seeing even the gentrification of things that we've been punished for before. Let's look at marijuana. What happened when they legalized marijuana? Did you see our black and brown brothers get out and become the scientists that they are? No. What we see is a bunch of regulations that keep us out of that industry. You know, and so it's the exact same thing that we're going to see in sex work. It's it's interesting because I'm so Brains glad that you brought our up our knowledge for free. Uh, I'm I'm so glad that you brought up that comparison because I was going to I was going to make that comparison in graduate school. Actually, one of my dearest friends, she has made it her work to educate communities of color on how we can profit from the legalization of because we knew based on white supremacy and the powers that be that with legalization the only people who were going to get rich and the only people who were going to continue to or uh, to continue the only people who were going to get rich were white folks right and privileged okay. individuals right. and the only ones who were going to continue to suffer and who have suffered under the criminalization of it is us right so oh, yeah. 
there's some mm -hmm. parallel here, it seems like, in your industry and the cannabis industry. Um, yeah, because there is a bigger industry at large, which is racism. Exactly. You know, and Jay said it so <laughs> beautifully, like, yeah, they legalized it, but two out of 200 had it from that legalization in that particular uh, club that, that she was talking about. So yes, until we get under this larger industry of racism and capitalism, we are gonna continue to see this oppression. And, and it's sad because when we're not represented in our own industry as free will thinking, autonomous, uh, worthy people, People do learn from sex workers. They learn the value of their, their bodies. They learn how to, to navigate interpersonal relationships. So again, if we're always objectified in through the white male, the straight white male racist gaze, this generational trauma continues of what type of ownership and what type of range we have for our own sex, sex and sexuality and even intimacy. Yeah. I wanna I wanna talk a little bit more about the even the non-sexual benefits of the, and value that sex workers bring to individuals. So we talked about reduction of anxiety. We talked about individuals who have sexual dysfunction. We talked about individuals who are um, ostracized in society because of maybe um, a disability, a physical disability, or because of the way they look, because they are not what the you know heterosexual white male deems as uh, desirable, right? And so, talk a little bit about the value. And Jay St. James, we'll talk. We'll, we'll start with you. Um, in the clients that you've seen over the years, what are you bringing to someone's life, even outside of the sexual aspect of it? There is definitely an emotional bond that develops um, with it's 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 another form of caretaking. It's just in some ways just like nursing. You have those boundaries, but there is an emotional bond. That person knows that they can come to you. That person knows that they can share things with you that are heavily demonized in society that bring them a lot of shame. They can share really vulnerable inner parts with you that for whatever reason, they're not sharing with their spouses. They're not sharing with their family. They haven't shared with par past partners. I think that brings people such a sense of acceptance of themselves when they start to see like, oh, that's actually like a two out of a 10 on the kink scale. I'm not doing anything that out of this world, nothing that I really needed to be shamed for. Um, it helps them deconstruct a lot of what they've grown up with. Um, white supremacy doesn't benefit anyone. You have to be the most cis, most white, most hyper mask. And there are so many men that don't meet that. And by seeing workers, especially in-person workers, they get that acknowledgement that all bodies are good. Your body is good too. You right now are the most important man in the world and they feel that. Wow. What do you feel like that's tainted and would you, and have you heard this before? And I'm, I'm just posing this. Do you feel like anybody saying, well, they're paying you. So you're, you're faking, you're, you're giving them a false sense of hope or security or that they are desired. What would your response be to someone who says that? I don't have to fake it with anybody. I could literally just lay there and they will pay to just be in the room with me. So you don't have to fake it with anybody. You don't have to boost them up beyond what there are. And people know authentic versus not. Um, I have, you know, the highest rates in Oregon. It's about two times the college athletes. And I wouldn't have those rates if I wasn't authentic. So um, people value and pay for what they value. So people feel it's more worthy because they're paying for it. <laughs> let, me tell you something. let me tell you something. Jay came <laughs> through with a straight, here, I got receipts. She said, my rate, rate, hunty yes. is, I love it. I love it. I love it. Listen, Julia said, Jay St. James is a vibe. Yes. I love you. I want to dive in really quickly to uh, about within the sex worker industry and hierarchy, right? Okay. So, Jasmine, the work that you all do um, as far as in the film industry, to my knowledge, doesn't have, I mean, I'm sure there's regulations, but mm -hmm. there is no criminalization at this point attached to that. Is that correct or am I incorrect on that? I'm, I'm you're, correct. you're correct. I mean, there, there are some requirements that are put in place for us to legally upload content 
to um, to platforms where people access porn. Um, okay. It is not a it's not a regulated industry, you know. Okay. So there are definitely some pitfalls with that, and I, I think. Um, you know, there, there's just some challenges there. And I think in every industry, you're going to have some bad players. And even when there is regulation, you're going to have folks that try to find ways to, you know, work under the radar and things like that. But, you know, we do have certain things like, you know, talent testing um, and, and those type of requirements to shoot with larger, um, larger production companies. But um, one of the things about, um, I love the, the, the fact that you said about the hierarchy, right? I call it a hierarchy. Um, because, you know, there is this like, um, well, I only can't, I'm only a cam model, so I don't touch people, you know, or like okay. you can only, you, you can only see my stuff on, on OnlyFans. You'll never catch me on Pornhub. Right. And it, you know, all of these things are like, oh, well, I work in a brothel. Um, they are just like out there screening their own clients. Right. But we, okay. I want to make a parallel for y'all. We do the same shit in any oppressive community. Right. A lot of times people try to make put this like, oh, like sex workers are, you know, they are always catty and fighting. Look at the three of our different skin complexions on here. Yeah. yeah. You know, somebody, you know, or uh, uh, how people would say things like Jay's hair is, you know, more together than Jasmine's. Well, yeah, it is. OK. So, <laughs> you know, like, oh, no, no, no. But, but Jasmine, this morning, <laughs> no, I'm really close to the camera now. <laughs> But Jasmine, listen, this is this is why I was and I'm thank you for bringing this out, because right in the black community, when we're talking about all black lives matter. Right. And I did a show on this. A lot of times the Black Lives Matter movement for some did not include black trans lives. Absolutely. Right. So when I was so I'm asking the question about within when there's this advocacy for sex workers, do all sex workers matter? from within the community? And if not, what has been the discord um, that exists? And, and thank you, you said hierarchy, hierarchy, right? Um, for you, Jay, have you felt anything from on-screen actors that say, well, well, you're out there in person with people and we, you know, we're, is there, is there a professionalized, you know, saying like, well, we're professionals in, because we're in the adult film industry. Is there any of that that, that happens like it does in the LGBTQ community. I'm a gay man, right? But there's privilege with being a cisgender gay man and man, right? But still that I recognize that a non cisgender black woman, right? Is going to be treated in a different way, even me as an oppressed person. So I just, let's, let's bring that up. Yeah. Um from from people in the actual adult film industry, no. I have um, AFVN winners that ask to work with me and stuff like that. Um, from new cam people that don't show their genitals, yes, I get it a lot from them. I don't get it from people that actually do porn, um, but I definitely get it a lot from people who think that um, their online, you know, only fans only gives them some sense of respectability that, you know, others don't have. Um, interesting fact, if you're in the top 3% of only fans, you might only be making 150 a month. So I don't feel bothered when they come at me like that. Because Wait, so are they lying? Because some of these people, some of these people be talking about they make it <laughs> coin. You, you pulling a whole card, Jay. Listen. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm going like, to say that I run a lot of sex worker groups and black sex worker collective knows everything. So I'm going to tell you one only fans is notorious for, for not paying and two, and that's already come out. And two, if you're in the top 3%, you might, because of percentages only be making 150 a month because so many people are making nothing on there. So there is, you know, this whole respectability conversation that goes on, but at you know, at 40 years old, I'm not going to hear it from people that aren't paying their bills with what they do. Come on now. Okay, okay. Yeah. listen, I, I... <laughs> okay. Can, can, can I just, can please, I just, Dad, come on. I, I just want to add, a moment. Yes, please, okay, let ahead. me let you gather your thoughts. You thought right. people would run around here rich. Um, 
No, I think it's <laughs> it is really, really interesting from the perspective of you know um, that that respectability politics. I mean, I think a lot of that does have to do in like time and place and level of acceptance of self and where your own shame meter falls into what you're doing. And it is very rare that, especially in this day and age, where we have to diversify ourselves in everything, that a sex worker is only working in one lane. You know, there is definitely a lot of overlap, um, you know, from everything like, yeah, I got an OnlyFans. And as soon as COVID lets me, I can't wait to be out there in dungeons and having live sessions as well. Um, so I do think that it is also it's a maturity thing. And it's also it does. It's usually a reflection of where the person is in their own journey of accepting um, or rejecting shame around their their position in sex work. Yeah. You know, I wanted since we we brought up OnlyFans, right? And 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 Jaden pulled the cover out from a lot of people. Um <laughs> the, do you feel like the mainstreaming of OnlyFans, because I'm be honest, like listen, there's a few of these Instagram models that I'm waiting to see if they got an OnlyFans. Cause I'm like, you know what? I've been wondering what's up under them draws, right? And and sometimes, listen, so the mainstreaming of OnlyFans, do you feel like it legitimizes the sex work industry when Beyonce calls it out in her song? Or do you feel like it's not even necessary? Do you feel like it hurts or helps? Either way. I feel like you can fetishize some and I feel like when you do that, you still need to make sure that you're centering the most marginalized of the group. Um, but I don't think it's hurting it. I think it's bringing it into the mainstream. We just have to make sure we still center the right people, make sure we aren't falling to respectability politics. Thank you, Jasmine. Mm -hmm. You have anything to, to say on yeah, that? No, I, I completely agree with Jay. Yeah. All right. Listen, I I could go on, but we are at our time. I just want to thank the both of you, Jay St. James, Jasmine, the Jet. Jasmine, where did the Jet, where, where did that come from? Jet Set and Jasmine. Where did that come from? I'm just curious. Well, Prior, prior to COVID, I was traveling the globe. It, I just so happened that every time I used to pop up on a on a sh uh, show, I was in a different city. The name stuck, and it became a manifestation. So we usually okay. are traveling the globe, doing workshops and webinars and sessions. Um, so post COVID, I'm like office setting. <laughs> I love listen, listen. So here's the deal. Jay and Jasmine, I'm going to have to have you guys back because I feel like there's so much more that we can unpack. Um, this conversation, I know for me, was super enlightening um, in a lot of different ways. And I know for the viewers, we already saw some comments there that folks were like, thank you, thank you, thank you for this platform to elevate this voice because it is so important. And I hope anybody out there who were one of the individuals that really had a shameful gaze upon individuals in this industry. I hope today you heard the voice of individuals who are in this industry that are not forced, that have autonomy, that are um, enterprising, and we can go on and on and don't feel like that they have to be something to make you feel comfortable. So I'm going to put that out there too. Again, like you get to be authentically who you are. And I thank you for bringing that to the naked truth experience um tonight i am good we're gonna do a part two at some point so y'all just be ready for my phone call um is there anything either one of you want to say just to close this out if if there's any resources people uh should be looking out for where can they find you um let, let us know and uh jasmine we'll start with you and then we'll end out with you jay Sure. So um, subscribe to my OnlyFans. Duh. How about it? <laughs> it's at Jet Set Jasmine. Yeah. And please check out our work at RoyalFetishXXX.com. And if you need a safe for work, JetSettingJasmine.com. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jay St. James, how about you? Where can people find you or anything you just want to share to close out with us today? Definitely check out sex work. Worker Collective, uh, Instagram, website, Facebook, BSWC everywhere. Yeah, and she and I, I know the the connection was a little bad right there for a moment, but you were you were mentioning the Black Sex Workers Collective. Yes, is that what you said there? Yeah, Black Sex Worker Collective on Instagram, Facebook, website, BSWC. Perfect. I'm dead Foxy online, but definitely check out Black Sex Worker Collective. Yes, yes, yes. Listen, um, ladies, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I want to thank everybody who tuned in for the episode 32 of the Naked Truth Experience. Now, I don't know about you. I listen. I know somebody learned something. I know we learned a 
lot here tonight. And hopefully, again, it broadened your perspective um, on an industry that has been around forever. Hear what I'm saying? And that many of us engage with in so many different ways. I want to thank my guest, as always. I want to thank Dan, my wine expert, for being there. Listen, we've got one more episode in the month of November, so make sure you are back here next Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern because we're doing a special Friends Giving episode where we are uplifting stories of the chosen family, transformative love that accepts. I'm so excited about that episode coming up. And as you all enter into this holiday season, I know many of us, because of COVID, we're not going to be able to be with our families in the way that we may wish to be with our families, but I just encourage you to please just continue to show love to one another. Again, continue to connect with each other, even if it can't be in a physical form, just to let someone know that you appreciate them and know that you are appreciated and know that you are more than enough. And before I close out, once again, I want to say to my beautiful trans people, brothers and sisters, we see See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for living your truth day in and day out and happy Trans Awareness Week. And make sure, please, that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. You find us on Facebook, find us on Instagram, like, share, and that's all I got to say tonight, folks. I'm full. I'm happy to be here. And as I always say, oh, first of all, I want to thank my illustrious producer, Julius Jones. Thank you, sir. You make it happen for me. You make it happen for this platform. As I always say, y'all have a good night.